Okay, so the world of Atrahasis, the world we're stepping into, uh, its cosmology is an unusual one. And we can piece it together from things like the text. We can also piece that together with cultural clues like uh, visual representations of what the universe looked like. And this is one example. This is called the Ada Cylinder Seal. It has these inscriptions or these, these carvings of, of images in reverse. And what you do is you take that and you roll it in wet clay. And then you can see the image the way it's, it's meant to look. So it works like a stamp. And on this seal, we see some characters that we can recognize if we know enough about them. So for instance, we have uh, Inky here, remember who is the, the, the god of the, the water that comes from beneath the, the earth, that is the sweet water, the, the fresh water, as opposed to the ocean water. Uh, and you see he, that he's got these sort of water wings, and we see this a lot. There's not only water wings, it's, it, but there are fish either swimming up it or something. Um, and wherever we see this individual with the, the horned helmet that indicates a god, uh, and these water wings, we know that's Inky, or Ea. Then we have uh, over here uh, a hunter with a bow whose, whose crown also indicates that he's a god uh, on the far left. And this is probably Elil. Uh, Elil is referred to as having a bow, you know, as a storm god. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but it's possible. Then we have uh, Astarte or Ishtar, uh, who we'll later, later see as Inanna in the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, standing on top of these mountains. And we recognize here the mountains that, that hold up the world, presumably with Mesopotamia down here. And this character here, uh, we see these sort of wavy lines coming up from his shoulders. Uh, similar to Inky's water wings, we have uh, the, the sun god, Shamash, is rising. So he's coming up between the mountains. Uh, so we can see that uh, this is probably the world. Up here, the gods are sort of standing very large and very distant from the, the world. But their, their attention is all focused on that little uh, middle area there. This is something like what the world would have looked like. Something like their cosmology. And the beginning of Atrahasis is a cosmogony that explains how that cosmology came to be. So in this cosmogony, the Anunnaki, the elder gods of the Mesopotamians, create the Agigi, the younger gods, the younger generation of gods. And they do it expressly for the purpose of creating the world creating uh, the world that the Mesopotamians knew. And that means they dig the riverbeds, like the Tigris and Euphrates River. That's the first thing uh, of, of importance that's described in the text, which lets us know how important the Tigris and Euphrates River were to the Mesopotamians. It's, it, it's described as their lifeblood. Uh, they dig the riverbeds, and they dig the canals between those rivers. Uh, notice the uh, mixed image schema of the rivers described as canals. Now, rivers don't have to be dug. Nobody went, a, uh, went along, you know, some ancient Army Corps of Engineers and dug out the trenches for the rivers to go in. Water finds, you know, the, the lowest point and then uh, continues to move that direction. But they equated these with the canals they themselves had been creating for centuries before that would enable them to irrigate crops and, and, and that sort of thing. So the gods are imagined as, as doing this. That's where these things came from. That's where the world came from, the work of gods. Uh, also notice the time period they work for. Uh, they're described as working for 3,600 years. Uh, not only, you know, the text we're reading right now, coincidentally, is about 3,600 years old. It was, you know, that long ago that uh, the text was written. But more importantly, it's a hexadecimal number. Uh, it's a round number, not because it's divided, divisible by 10, but because it's divisible by six. Uh, this is something we get from the Mesop Mesopotamians through the Greeks. Um, we have 360 degrees in a circle. We have 12 hours in a day. Each of those hours is divided into 60 minutes. All of these mathematical uh, uh, figures that are divided into uh, a base six number system uh, come from the Mesopotamians because the Greeks and the other uh, people around the ancient world knew that the Mesopotamians were the, the masters of math. And that was part of their cosmology. That's, you know, their drive to understand the world is what made them innovate uh, a lot of the principles of mathematics uh, that we still carry on today. Uh, now we also have the introduction of, uh, introduction of conflict. Uh, the conflict uh, at first is the fact that the Agigi have to build the world and it's a lot of work. Uh, so they want to rebel. They want to uh, especially confront uh, the, the chief of the uh, Gigi, who was one of the Anunnaki, one of the elder gods, Elil, and tell him that we're tired of working, uh, we're not going to do it anymore. Uh, 
And with this, we have what uh, memory researcher Michael Schudson, that I mentioned in the, uh, the first week, first unit, uh, described as narrativization, uh, a term he gets from Hayden White, a historian. But narrativization is when we take history or we take our personal memory, and instead of just remembering it exactly as it happened, we try to put it into a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's an original state of equilibrium, uh, then there's some conflict introduced, uh, and that conflict is resolved to, to create the end. Uh, in this case, it's not history and it's not memory that's being turned into narrative, it's the whole, uh, uh, since the beginning of time, the, the creation of the world itself has to be fit into a narrative form. It can't just be a scientific explanation of uh, you know, physical forces interacting. We need protagonists, we need antagonists, we need conflict, we need resolution of conflict, and that's what we have in this cosmogony. Uh, so the, the Agigi confront Elil, uh, and it's a confrontation that's you know, maybe kind of humorous. It's uh, uh, Elil is you know this powerful god of war and storms and, and that sort of thing, but these lesser gods that uh, work for him uh, come to his house. Literally, he has a house, and uh, you know he tells his uh, his vizier Nusku to lock the gate and stand in front of me. So he's kind of hiding behind this uh, uh, this servant of his uh, because he's afraid of this group of wor protesting workers. So there could be something uh, humorous about this, uh, and it might come from the fact that the particular uh, culture that, or the particular uh, city-state in Mesopotamia that's uh, creating this version of the narrative might not revere Elil that much, but they clearly revere Inki. So Inki is much more mature, uh, he's compassionate for first the Agigi, he wants to solve their problem, and later he's gonna show compassion for human beings when none of the other gods will. Uh, and he's uh, very uh, diplomatic about it. He doesn't just enforce his own will on everybody else. So we may have cultures that revere different gods differently, so they portray them differently in the narrative, even though they're telling the same basic story. But it may not have been that easy to figure out exactly what was happening because of the way the text itself presents the elements of this story. So if you look at, in your book, on, on pages 12 and 13, you see some repetitions that, that might be a little bit confusing at first. Notice repetitions like this. Uh, everything in your text uh, is there for one reason or, or another. It, it might not make good storytelling the way we're used to it. it. It may not be the kind of thing you would find in a novel, but that's all the more reason to analyze what it is and, and then try to come to an explanation of how it got there, make an inference about how it got there. In this case, on page 12, we have the same passages uh, read more than once, or written more than once. Uh, Elil is talking to Nusku, and he says, Nusku, open your door, take your weapons, stand before me. Uh, incidentally, those brackets that were stand before me uh, is, is written, uh, the brackets indicate something is missing, there's a break in the text, and yet Stephanie Daly has filled in those brackets. Uh, you can probably see if you look further down where, those, where, where that information is coming from. But um, he says, you know, take up your weapons in the assembly of the gods, bow, then stand, and then tell them your father Anu, your counselor, warrior Elil, your chamberlain Ninurta, and your canal controller Inugi have sent me to say who is in charge of this rabble, the, the Igigi who were revolting, who is in charge of the fighting, who declared war, who ran to the door of Elil. Uh, then Nusku takes the message, uh, he does what he's told, he, uh, uh, goes to the assembly of the Agigi uh, on behalf of Elil, because Elil is hiding in his house. Uh, it's Nusku that gets sent out to go negotiate with this, uh, uh, th this gang. And he bows, he tells the message, and we have the same text repeated. Your father Anu, your, your counselor warrior Elil, your chamberlain Ninurta, and your canal controller Inugi have sent me to say who is in charge of the rabble, who is in charge of the fighting, who declared war, who ran to the door of Elil. Now you're probably thinking, why is this in here twice? Is this a mistake? And if it was a novel, it wouldn't make much sense. There wouldn't be any reason to, for that to be there. But remember, if this had an oral tradition before it was inscribed in uh, tablets, then this would have been sung. We would have had the, the harpist singing this, and when you're reading something and you hear something repetitive like that, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. You don't like having to read the same thing over again when you don't know why you're, you're doing that. Uh, but if it's a song, then we like to hear a chorus over and over again. 
probably a chorus. This is probably why uh, it's being repeated. The same thing just below that. In blue box number one, the Gigi are giving Nusku the reply to Elil. In blue box number two, Nusku is delivering that reply to Elil. Uh, the same lines, but with a different role in the narrative. In other words, they tell something different, even though it's using the same words. The first time, it's Elil uh, speaking, or in, in uh, the yellow box number one, it's Elil speaking to Nusku. And yellow box number two, it's Nusku speaking to the Agigi. In blue box number one, it's the Agigi speaking to Nusku. And in blue box number two, it's Nusku uh, speaking to Elil, delivering that message back and forth. It plays a different role in the story. But then we have a different kind of repetition. If you notice that red box, this is uh, Stephanie Dolly, the editor, uh, letting us know that uh, there's a gap in the text uh, at, at this point, uh, where the we have the line, the warning signal was loud enough, we kept hearing the noise, then there's a break in the word do, and then there's another break in the word tasks, and then uh, we have a lot of missing lines, uh, broken tablet. So instead of just leaving it there and letting us guess what happens, she takes one of the standard, or actually two of the standard Babylonian uh, fragments, and uses that to fill in the narrative. But remember, the, the Standard Babylonian version was written a thousand years after Ipik Aya is writing the, the Old Babylonian version. So there are gonna be some differences. And the fact that she's taking a, a, a whole text and uh, adding it in, she's not trying to smooth it out. She's not just adding a transition in there. Uh, and so there is a repetition that's there because she's placing one text beside the other. So if you don't notice the letters in the left-hand margin, uh, it might seem like the text repeats itself. Or, or the, it might seem as the same thing happens twice in the story. Uh, it might seem that there's half of an event uh, that stops and starts over at the beginning of the event before describing what happened next. It seems like Elil and the Agigi resolve their differences and they come up with a new plan, but then at the bottom of page 13, we're back to having Nusku play diplomat and the feud is still going. So you have to pay attention to the editorial notes in order to notice that this is a redaction. This is a combination of texts. And if you flip over to page 14, you see the, the second Standard Babylonian fragment added. And it contains information not included in the first SBV fragment. So that means it also duplicates uh, things we've already read. So it duplicates a line from the Old Babylonian version, but it contradicts the Old Babylonian version. So first of all, Inki is called Ea. Uh, that's, uh, that's a name that was used for him uh, in other uh, Mesopotamian city-states that had slightly different ideas about who he was. Similar enough that you, could, you knew that Inki and Ea were basically the same uh, god of the waters beneath the, the earth who helps out mankind, who sends the seven sages to teach uh, civilization and technology and writing and all of this. Same things happening, so we know it's basically the same character, but slightly different beliefs about him. And, obviously, a different name. So there's a clue for, in the name, Ea, that this is coming from a different culture, same basic story, but a different narrative. Uh, and not only is uh, Inky named something different, uh, but he, as Ea, is saying in the standard Babylonian version what Anu said in the old Babylonian version. So it's not just a different name for one character, uh, it's a different role for that character uh, in this other narrative. So it's Inky, or Ea, who sympathizes with the Agigi and argues their case uh, before the Anunnaki in Elil. Uh, this isn't just a change of name, uh, it changes the story, and it does so to create a transition to the next event in the story, and so it makes sense. Uh, the next thing is the creation of man, and it makes more sense that Ea, who's gonna suggest the creation of, of human beings, and uh, suggest that this is a way to resolve the conflict, it makes more sense that he is the one uh, to make this, this speech. Now, this type of repetition is called the doublet. Uh, the first type of repetition, when it looked like a song, uh, a chorus that was sung over and over again. That's called a refrain. And, you know, that term you don't have to know. But notice it's there for a reason. It tells a different part of the story even if it uses the same words. But this, we know f because the editor tells us this is uh, a different, this is a, redact a redaction of a different narrative. And the, the clue, even if you, she didn't tell you that, you would know because here's the same event described over again uh, in different terms with slight alterations. Uh, so a doublet, so a doublet is the same story told uh, in the same narrative twice. And it usually contains some sort of alteration or some sort of uh, contradiction uh, that's uh, the kind of thing that would not normally be in a refrain. So it's as if we've got this gap and we take 
a, a chunk of one story, try to cram it into another story, and it kind of sort of fits, but not quite. So we have these kind of doublets several times throughout the text, um, and throughout the, the text of myths from Mesopotamia. On page 21, we have another with uh, the standard Babylonian version. Uh, on pages 23 to 27, we have a really long passage with uh, the SBV uh, tablets. And that seems to start over and retell story elements that we've already read. And so it's very confusing if you're not noticing the SBV and OBV over in the, the left-hand uh, column. Why, why is this happening again? Why has the Sarupu disease happened twice? Uh, and the reason is that the editor, Stephanie Dolly, uh, she does this to uh, try to give the OBV narrative that's transcribed by Ipik Aya the way he writes it, and then the standard Babylonian version the way it's written, and not adding her own 20th century, even though she's an expert, she's trying not to add her own uh, words, she's just trying to give us the words as they come to us from those tablets. But remember this experience untangling the doublets and uh, the contradictions in this redaction, because we're gonna have to do it again later in ancient texts that we might not have realized were redactions. So the Agigi are pacified by being told that they aren't gonna have to do the work of the gods anymore. Uh, the solution of that is Inki, or Ea, uh, decides to create human beings. Human beings will do the work of the gods. And he does this with the womb goddess, uh, you know, she's described as the womb goddess uh, Nintu, mo most commonly, but uh, for several passages she's referred to as Belet Ili, uh, and sometimes she's referred to as Mami, uh, just like you know, a child would say, mommy. Uh, she's basically this mother goddess. And the fact that she has different names within the same text probably indicates that uh, you know, everybody has a mother goddess and several different mother goddesses were probably combined at some point uh, e long before even the old Babylonian version was written. So by the time the OBV is written, she's already uh, known uh, by several different aspects. Uh, but notice the way that she creates human beings. She's the womb goddess. Shouldn't she give birth to human beings? Well. She kind of does, but she goes through this ritual uh, that has more imagery. It comes from this schema about baking bricks. Uh, the schema of you take clay, uh, you bake them in an oven, and they come out hard, and you're able to then do something with them in the world. You have to bake them in the oven, in the kiln, in order to make them usable. Uh, the same thing, creating human beings from clay, uh, firing them in the kiln, and there's no mention of, of a womb, but the kiln itself seems to be the womb. Uh, and so uh, we also have Inki's necessary role in this seems to indicate w the way the, the Mesopotamians conceived of the role of the man in uh, uh, the procreation process. Uh, he has to have something to you know, put into the womb before uh, uh, Bilad Ili or Nintu is able to create uh, human beings using uh, her womb. So we have uh, a very distinct metaphor here. So we have one schema is uh, the womb itself, uh, the, the mother's way of, of carrying a child to term and then giving birth. That's uh, one concept, one schema, one way of imagining something in the real world. The other schema is the schema for the way uh, bricks are baked in a kiln or uh, cuneiform tablets or, or anything else in the Mesopotamian world that uses this resource that's so abundant. So two schemas combined uh, are give us this metaphor. And it's probably not the way you conceive of or you know, any, anyone in our culture typically conceives of the ways uh, human beings are, are, are brought. But we still use other uh, metaphors, other schemas. Uh, this metaphor also gives us a lot to think about with the role of the god Ilawela. Uh, they have to, in order to create life in these uh, clay uh, human beings they create, they have to sacrifice this uh, god named Ilawela, or he who had intelligence. And uh, they say, let us hear the drum beat forever after. Let a ghost come into existence from the god's flesh. Now the drum beat seems to indicate the heart. Here we have another metaphor, a pretty easy to understand metaphor. So Ilawela, who had intelligence, they slaughtered in their assembly. Nintu mixed the clay with his flesh and blood. They heard the drum beat forever after that. They heard the heartbeats of human beings after that. Uh, presumably. A ghost came into existence from the god's flesh, and she, Nintu, proclaimed it as a living sign. Uh, the ghost existed so as not to forget the slain god. And page 16 goes on to tell us how uh, 
Far-sighted Inky and wise Mommy went to the room of fate. The womb goddess, goddesses were assembled. He trod the clay in her presence. Uh, she kept reciting an incantation. For Inky, staying in her presence, made her recite it. Uh, so she goes through this very ritualistic uh, process. She's not just making clay the way you would do if you were in a hurry. And then after that, she makes these rules for the people. She says, in the house of a woman who is giving birth, the mud brick shall be put down for seven days. Belit Ely, wise mommy, shall be honored. Uh, the midwife shall rejoice in the house, and when the woman gives birth to the baby, the mother of the baby shall uh, sever herself, in other words, the umbilical cord. Uh, it's, uh, some areas are broken here, but we get that this is a, not only a ritual that's being performed once, but she's giving these rules for performing this ritual in, in, in the future. And so this is an explanation of where the ritual comes from. We do this, we being the ancient Mesopotamians, do this ritual because this is the way human beings were created. And this is what an ideology is. It's an explanation with a story about where a ritual came from. It may or may not be accurate in this case, probably not, but they needed to, an origin story for this thing that's so important, such an important part of their culture, part of their, uh, a ritual that goes with uh, birth. And we also have an origin story about a more familiar ritual, although it's hard to make out. We see the lines, a man to a girl, and then a break in the line. Uh, then the next line, there's another break. Uh, but a beard can be seen, then something's missing. On a young man's cheek, in gardens and waysides, the wife and her husband choose each other. So what we might have explained here is a marriage ritual, and this is the origin of marriage. Uh, the, the ritual of marriage for the Mesopotamians is coming from this uh, initial action by these two gods. Uh, Renintu is the one who's making these rules that will govern later generations uh, with marriage, with rituals about birth, and that sort of thing. So bringing humans into the world ends the conflict with, between Elil and the Agigi, uh, but then of course uh, we take on that conflict. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the work that, that humans complain about, but the, the fact of human existence becomes its own issue. We have three disasters, uh, natural disasters take place, uh, and they all start, notice each section of this starts with the, the, the phrase, 600 years, less than 600 years past. Um, this lets us know that we're moving on to the next chapter, the next uh, uh, sequence. So we have these three disaster sequences. First is the Sarupu disease, then is the drought, and then it's the flood. Now it might seem like more than three plagues because we have more redactions of the SBV uh, interspersed. So if you thought the gods sent the Sarupu disease twice and they seem to think it was a great idea both times, that's probably because the SBV repeats the OBV. You have to pay attention uh, to the, the left-hand column. But notice, why do the gods send these three disasters in the first place? Uh, it might, it, it's pretty, pretty easy to trivialize, to, to say that uh, it seems kind of ridiculous. Uh, quote, the country became too wide, the people too numerous. The country was as noisy as a bellowing bull. The god grew restless at their clamor. Uh, Elil had to listen to their noise, end quote. So Elil complains about losing sleep from the noise created by humanity. And from his point of view, it's human beings are just a nuisance. This might seem, like a, a nuisance wouldn't be worthy of, of killing off the entire population. This might seem overkill. But remember from the, the way Elil acted in the confrontation with the Agigi, he's not being portrayed very sympathetically. Uh, we can say that, uh, pretty easily that he's the antagonist of the whole Atrahasa story. He's the bad guy. He's the one who's causing the problems. But beyond just Elil's motivation for uh, wiping out humanity, uh, notice that there is a real problem that we can imagine in the historical context of ancient Mesopotamia. That first line, the country became too wide, the people too numerous. So as fertile as Mesopotamia was, it could every now and then have reached a maximum population, or the maximum population it could support. And when people come to live together in large numbers in a urban area, and keep in mind this is the first large urban area, these individual uh, city-states in, in Mesopotamia, uh, this is the first time that people then become dependent on uh, resources, on food, and that sort of thing that aren't coming from uh, land immediately around them. Uh, if they live in this uh, very overpopulated area, they depend on the farmers out in the swamps, and the reed swamps around these city states to bring the food in. Uh, and if that dries up, they can't, if it's every man for himself, every person for themselves, they can't just sort of grab food, you know, uh, within walking distance. They're very far removed, 
and all of a sudden this large population is in this area that because of some drought, because of some disease, uh, has removed all of their resources. So this would be very much more deadly than it would be the, the same event, a drought or a, a plague, would be if it was uh, in a, uh, a sparsely populated area. Uh, also, if, it's, if the disease is affecting human beings, it's gonna be transmitted much more quickly in an urban area where people come together in a very tight living space. And we hear what happens to human beings as a population, but that's when, at the bottom of page 18, this is when we have the character of Atrahasis, the only named human being in the whole story. Uh, and it's through his eyes that we see everything that happens to the, the human race. Uh, at the bottom of page 18, now there was one Atrahasis, whose ear was open to his god Inki. He would speak with his god, and his god would speak with him. And of course, the thing that he says to Inki uh, is, uh, he complains about what's happening to human beings, and he wants to know what, how can Inki help. Uh, this is a very uh, early example of what we'll later call the theodicy problem. It's not a term you need to know just, just yet. But when bad things happen to people who uh, do what the gods want or what they, they think the gods want, they wanna know why. Why am I being punished? Or is this a punishment? Why is this happening? Why doesn't the god who I am loyal to help me out in this situation? And in this case, when we have a polytheistic system, obviously it's because it's not the, the one good god that, you know, that you're loyal to, it's another god that's creating this problem. But that also, it, it, that doesn't mean it's necessarily that simple because uh, in order for Inki to help humanity, he has to defy the will of the other gods. And that becomes the real sort of dramatic tension for the rest of the story. So we might say, uh, because of the title, uh, the title as it's been given to us, not the title that the Sumerians gave or the uh, Babylonians gave it, which was be when the gods like men or when the gods instead of men, the first line. But because we're calling it Atrahasis, we might think, oh, Atrahasis must be the protagonist. But the fact that we're just now being introduced to him, this is a, called a character exposition. Uh, the first time we see this character comes so late and his problem, uh, by the time it, it affects him, it's already something that's, that's been in the works for a while. And it's Inky who's actually gonna take the, the necessary steps to solve that problem, or at least tell Atrahasis how to solve that problem. And Inky really has uh, a lot of uh, tension that he has to, uh, dramatic tension that he has to solve with uh, his fellow god, Elil. Uh, may indicate that the protagonist could be Inky. Uh, I'm not gonna say it's one or the other, uh, but uh, we have at least a dual protagonist here. And it's through advice that Inky gives that uh, the, the first two uh, disasters are able to be averted. Both, in both cases, we have a god who is tasked with withholding something or sending out something to destroy human, humanity. Uh, the first is Namtara. Namtara is the, the vizier of the, the goddess of the underworld, Erishkigal who we'll come back to when we talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh. But there's this idea that he controls the, the bolt to the gate of the underworld. Uh, whatever bad things are down in the underworld, you know, the world of death, the world of disease and all of that, uh, it's locked up. But um, Namtara can unlock that uh, gate and let this disease out. And that's what he's been ordered to do. It doesn't seem that he wants to do that, uh, but it's what he's ordered to do. And in the next uh, plague, or the next uh, disaster, the drought, uh, we have the, the rain god Adad is tasked with locking up the, the rainwater so that water doesn't fall. Uh, and Inki, as the god of the, under, uh, the underground rivers, is supposed to keep the, the Apsu, the underground water, locked up as well. Uh, Inki can be relied on by humanity to come up with a way around that, but uh, in both the case of Namtara and the case of Adad, uh, Inki has to come up with a way to get them to change their mind and not do what Elil has, has made them promise to do. Uh, he's got to get them to feel sympathy for humanity. And to do this, he does something that might be kind of hard to follow in the narrative. Uh, what he does is tell Atrahasis to tell his people uh, to, uh, to not revere your gods, to, to not make sacrifices. Uh, he says, do not revere your gods, do not pray to your goddesses, but search out the door of Namtara, the god of the underworld. Uh, bring a baked loaf into his presence. May the flower offering reach him. Uh, may he be shamed by the presence and wipe away his hand. Now, 
his hand being his action? How do you get him to take away this thing he's done? Well, you don't necessarily threaten him, but notice that human beings have stopped uh, sacrificing to the gods. It doesn't say exactly sacrificing, but by not revering your gods, not praying to your goddesses, they're sort of cutting off connections between themselves and the rest of the gods, but they're going to bring a loaf to Ada. They're gonna bring a sacrifice, uh, sorry, to Namtara. Uh, by bringing the sacrifice to Namtara, uh, they're doing something, even though he is persecuting them, they are showing kindness to him that they're not showing to the other gods, and this seems to be why uh, uh, he is shamed by it. Uh, so if you hurt, do something to hurt someone else, but they do something to help you after that, knowing that you're hurting them, then of course you feel ashamed. And that seems to be what leads um, first Namtara and then later Adad uh, to, to do this, to, to wipe away their hand, to recall the action that hurt humanity. But in order for this to work, you have to get these gods to feel a certain way. In other words, you have to know what's gonna cause them to feel sympathy for humans. Uh, and uh, Atrahasis does this, but their sympathy comes from the devotion that they see in human beings. So they have to be thinking about what humans think. So a human has to think, how do I get a god to think I feel this way? And notice it's Inki who has to get Atrahasis to understand that he needs to get Adad and Namtara to think that he thinks uh, highly of them, that he has uh, respect for them even though they're, they're persecuting him. So this is uh, four levels of what we'll call theory of mind. I'm not gonna put that in, in red text yet. We'll get to it again. We'll have a longer explanation of how theory of mind works in a later lecture. But it's the ability to think about what other people are thinking and to think about what other people think you think or what other people think yet other people think. Uh, and it goes to this level of complexity really sort of, uh, it's sort of a struggle, it's a struggle for us to figure out when reading the text. But notice, this is how we interact with people every day. We wanna know, did I offend someone? Or does this person think that I'm not offended by what he just said? Something like this. We have to do this every day. And novels, whether it's you know uh, 3,600 years ago or today, novels really push this element of our psychology, our ability to think about what other people and other characters think and how they think about other characters. So we'll definitely come back to this in all the texts we read throughout the rest of the semester. But this is all I'm gonna say about it right here. But if you're trying to figure out what happened, why did these diseases end, it seems to be because Inky came up with a plan to get the gods sympathetic to humans, but he had to get Atrahasis to perform these steps in order for that to work. So we have the Sarupu disease uh, that the gods decide. Elil is really the one pushing this. He's the one that wants to wipe out human beings because they're too populous, uh, they're, they're too noisy. They've spread out too far. So all the gods agree, Inky seemingly reluctantly, and then Inky comes up with a way to uh, make the one god that's sort of acting that plague, acting that uh, drought, uh, causing it to happen, using his hand, uh, his, his own agency, get that god to change his mind. So uh, the first sort of sequence is the Sarupu disease, the second sequence is the drought, and then the third sequence we recognize. That's the flood. Since the, these tablets were discovered, the thing that popped into everyone's mind, at least everyone in the Western world, the, the Judeo-Christian world, was, hey, I've heard this story before, I know this, this is Noah's Ark. This is the story of Noah gathering the animals onto this giant boat, in order to survive this storm sent by a god, uh, but Noah himself was warned by God to, to do this ahead of time so that human beings would survive. I know this story, I've heard it before. But remember everything we've gone through in this class up to this point uh, has led us to be careful of this kind of association. Uh, when I read an unfamiliar text, like Shank and Abelson say, I tend to try to uh, match it with a story I already know. But once I do that, I then limit what I'm able to see in that unfamiliar text. I act like that uh, Cambridge University student who's trying to recall the Chinook story of the War of the Ghosts. Uh, when I read about a canoe, I might forget the canoe because I don't really have a clear concept of what a canoe is. Instead, I think of a rowboat. Uh, I get bits and pieces from this new text, but I fill in, I, I try to make it fit into a pattern that comes from my culture. This is why we need to be very careful when we read Atrahasis and we re when we read the next flood text that we're going to read. Um, this is not 
the same narrative. It might be the same story. It, we see enough clues to tell us that this is basically the same story, but there are gonna be key differences that uh, are gonna be very important to the different cultures that we're gonna read this story in. So the history of cuneiform archeology span uh, has been defined by this search for uh, the Sumerian Genesis, uh, which is what some of these fragments were, were called in the late 19th century, early 20th century when they were discovered. This is how you get people's attention. Say, hey, I found an older version of the Bible or something that confirms the biblical flood or something that confirms what you already know, what you're familiar with. But when you actually study it the way a scholar needs to study it, you need to focus on not how this, uh, not just define it by the way it fits your familiar uh, schemas and your familiar scripts, but the way it is represented in its original context. Uh, so we don't want to, uh, just like the, the scholar might, or the, the Cambridge student might confuse the, the Chinook canoe for a boat, uh, a rowboat, uh, we don't want to confuse what's happening with the flood in Atrahasis with the description of the flood in Genesis. Although of course that parallel is gonna be there. We don't throw away that, that uh, parallel, we don't forget it. We sort of put it over to the side and, and, and wait to see how well it fits. And something that we definitely did not expect to see was a god not talking to his subject and saying build a boat, um, you know, put all the animals on it. Uh, instead, he's talking to a wall. On page 28 at the bottom, uh, twice the gods prompted by Elil have sent some sort of disaster. Uh, twice Inki has done something to undermine that plan and save humanity. So at the bottom of 28, we have Elil accusing Inki of sort of being underhanded. And he says, let us make farsighted Inki swear an oath. Inky made his voice heard, spoke to his brother gods, and he doesn't want to swear this oath. He says, why should you make me swear an oath? Why should I use my power against my people? Uh, the flood that, you know, your idea of this flood, uh, what is it to me? I don't even know. Uh, could I give birth to a flood? That is Elil's kind of work. So Inky is being roped in, and we don't know. We have a huge gap of 31 lines. And we don't know exactly what happens there, but we get the uh, impression that Inky has to swear this oath to these other gods. Then tablet three at the bottom of page 29 begins with Inky talking to a wall. And at first it may make no sense at all. Uh, he's literally talking to the wall. He says, wall, listen to me constantly. Read hut uh, as, as a noun of address. He's saying the name, read hut. Uh, make sure you attend to all my words. Dismantle the house, build a boat, reject position, uh, possessions and save living things. The boat that you build, and then there's a couple of broken lines, Roof it like the opsu, so that the sun cannot see inside it. Make the upper decks and the lower decks, the tackle must be very strong, the bitumen strong, in other words, the, the waterproofing uh, tar uh, must be strong to give it strength. I shall make the rain fall on you here. The wealth of birds, a hamper of fish. Um, so he's giving instructions to build an ark, ark uh, in our later terminology, but he's not giving it directly to Aftrahasis, he's giving it to a wall. Why is he doing that? Well, we can infer that if he's sworn an oath, uh, that oath must have been to not reveal to human beings. Uh, so instead of talking directly to Atrahasis, technically he's uh, not breaking his oath. This is might seem rather dishonest to us, but Inky is known as this sort of trickster figure. Now, like some, he's not like trickster figures in, in some other types of uh, uh, mythologies, like the Norse god Loki, who sometimes does good, but usually he's up to no good. Inky seems to be, you know, his heart's in the right place and he's actually very intelligent and he's doing the right thing for humans. But that means he actually has to lie to the other gods or at least come up with a way to not fulfill exactly uh, the, the, the promise he made to them. He doesn't want to wipe out human beings. And so he's talking to this reed wall. But why is he talking to this, this wall made out of reeds like the one uh, you see here? Uh, luckily, we know a lot about how these constructions, even 4,000 years ago, were built because up until Saddam Hussein uh, uh, 
you know, actively uh, attacked and, and, and massacred and, and uh, relocated a lot of people that lived in the Mesopotamian reed swamps, uh, those people were still building these reed houses and reed boats the way they had built uh, 4,000 years ago. Uh, the houses looked very much like the, the carvings uh, that we see from 4,000 years ago. And we see why this type of construction could have lasted so long. When you take these individual reeds, they're very flimsy on their own. You wouldn't think you could build something out of this, but when you bind them strongly enough and you build them in this uh, round roofed uh, architecture by bending them, they work like arches. And arches are much more stable than uh, a sort of square shaped uh, construction. So we still have houses or you know these temples and, and, and other buildings built this way from these bound reeds. But also that's the way uh, many of their boats were built. So you could see taking the material from a wall of a house like this and uh, using that to construct uh, something that would float and be rather, uh, rather strong, not only strong but flexible. Now there's a lot missing in exactly how this uh, craft was, was constructed. But there are other tablets and other versions of specifically of this uh, flood incident and the uh, Ea or Enki telling Atrahasis or uh, Ziosudra in, in another version, and later as we'll see, someone called Utnapishtim, uh, how to build uh, this ark. But uh, it's gonna be very difficult to not imagine the familiar Noah's Ark that we've seen since childhood. Uh, and if we think of this as not being built out of wood, not this sort of you know uh, steamship or cruise liner that's built out of wood, there's, the way it's usually represented in modern representations of, of Noah's Ark. But um, we imagine it as built out of reeds. Uh, we imagine it uh, as something uh, roofed like the Apsu. In other words, remember the, the water underground uh, is covered by the ground. And uh, Inki, who's the, the god of that realm, of this underground lake or uh, these underground waters, is saying, you know, build this boat but put uh, a roof on it like the Apsu. There is, uh, more recently there was a, a, a tablet discovered that gives much more specific instructions on how to build this ark that doesn't exactly mac match Atrahasis and it doesn't exactly match some of the other uh, texts, but it does seem to be very, very old and very, very specific. If these people are living in houses like the one uh, that Atrahasis lives in, if they are typically using boats that are built out of these reed boats and built out of bitumen and uh, they know how to build these things. So if you're talking to people who are familiar with this schema of boats, of houses, you're gonna have to describe it in terms that they would say, yeah, I think that would work, I think that would float. Because what you're describing or what Inky is describing is gonna be the largest boat that would have ever been built. It would, been, would have been bigger than anything uh, uh, that people would, would imagine, but it would be a bigger version of a schema they recognize. But they're still, Experts are gonna say, hey, I don't think that would float or I don't, uh, I don't know if that would work. So it's interesting that a recently discovered tablet uh, that was, uh, has recently been uh, written about by cuneiform uh, scholar Irving Finkel uh, gives very specific instructions. And using these instructions, Finkel uh, and a, a documentary crew uh, for the, the PBS program Nova uh, put together an actual uh, arc. But uh, Finkel noticed that the instructions on this new tablet do not look like the sort of pointed front uh, craft that we're typically used to. They resemble what's called a coracle, uh, this sort of completely round, not just you know almond shaped, but actually circular uh, type of uh, craft. And what's described is something like a coracle, only much, much larger. And what uh, Finkel and his uh, uh, construction crew that worked for uh, PBS, uh, what they were able to do in this uh, PBS documentary, uh, The Secrets of Noah's Ark, is they were able to build the type of craft described in that flood tablet uh, only at one fifth the size. Uh, so they were able to take the instructions that Inki gives to Atrahasis, and they weren't able to build it at the size described, but they were able to build it one fifth that size, and there was, moderate success getting it to float. But this at least gives us some idea of what the Babylonian uh, type of arc might have been cons uh, might have looked like. So we don't have to do what the Cambridge University student in Bartlett's study did. We don't have to confuse one type of boat with another. We have a, a much uh, better uh, schema of what a boat looks like based on actual uh, historical context. 
and I have posted a, a link to this documentary in uh, on Blackboard as extra resources. It's not required for you to watch, but it is very interesting. So and it's more entertaining than I'm, sh I'm sure than these lectures. So it's worth a watch if you have time. But if we have an idea of an ark that is at least conceivable, uh, that could have been built, does that mean there was a real flood? Uh, well, there were probably lots of floods. If we remember what Mesopotamia looks like and the how the waters flow in from uh, the, the mountains and the, uh, the, the inclined areas to the, the northeast and uh, west, uh, we see that it's a watershed. We can imagine, yeah, there were probably a lot of floods. Now, some floods would have been bigger than others. Uh, there was speculation, or there actually is uh, a, a layer or two in various archaeological sites, a layer of silt, uh, sometimes uh, more than 10 feet thick, indicating that this is the kind of silt that would normally be brought in by, by a flood. Uh, it's ambiguous as to whether or not all of that silt came at the same time. So you'd have a layer of uh, uh, settlement, you'd have debris from where people had actually, when people had actually lived there. Then you would have a layer on top of that of silt going up like 10 feet. That seems to indicate that uh, the people whose, whose artifacts are buried underneath that were wiped out by a flood. And then maybe uh, more uh, archeological remains on top of the silt. So somebody came back and built there later. But it's ambiguous because it could be that the people moved away uh, and there was uh, years of sort of a little bit of silt at a time built up and then, uh, it, but the reason the people weren't there might not have been because of the flood. It's ambiguous. But we do know that there are a periodic what we tend to call 100 year floods when they happen here. Uh, the kind of floods that, uh, you know, a generation that experiences that flood remembers it very well. The next generation may have heard stories about it. The third generation might not take it very seriously or it might not seem like the kind of thing that could happen to them until 100 years later it, it does happen again. This might be the kind of thing uh, that was the largest flood anybody had ever seen, but it wouldn't have been the only one for centuries. And so in the introduction to Atrahasis, Stephanie Daly says, it is probable that these ancient Near Eastern flood stories are versions of a tale which originated in lower Mesopotamia, though not necessarily in a single devastation, not necessarily a single flood. The variety of detail found in them illustrates the kaleidoscopic character of the folk tale, in which certain basic elements are widely used in new combinations and are adapted to national interests and different literary settings. All of these flood stories may be explained as deriving from one Mesopotamian original used in traveler's tales for over 2,000 years along the great caravan routes of Western Asia, translated, embroidered, uh, and adapted according to local taste to give a myriad of divergent versions. In other words, there may have been one flood that spawned this story and then that story became retold different ways in different places and so uh, one original is, uh, produces all these variations. But she also points out uh, there is the possibility of several different independent origins and that cannot be dismissed. For the idea of a universal flood may well have arisen to explain uh, observations in different places, things like uh, different massive floods in different places at different times, or uh, she goes on to say there, uh, the observation of marine fossils in mountains because people didn't know what we know about modern ge uh, geology that the, the what was once an ocean floor because of tectonic shift and that sort of thing gets pushed up into a mountaintop. They would have seen the skeletons, uh, the fossils of fishes on mountaintops and thought, oh, this must be, uh, must have once been underwater. But she says, the story of the flood was one of the most popular tales of ancient times and is found in several ancient languages, reworked to suit different areas and cultures so that different settings and details are found in each version. So we may have one original with lots of variation. We may have different uh, flood stories that converge into one and then of course continue to vary. So in the conclusion of Atrahasis, we have the flood arrive and unfortunately we have a huge gap of about 58 lines noted on page 33. But before and after that gap, we have the goddess Nintu, remember the, the womb goddess, the, the mother goddess, uh, is weeping. She now regrets the fact that the gods altogether decided to send uh, this flood and she blames, in particular, blames Elil. Says, we all did this because Elil wanted it. Uh, but her regret over the flood is something we're gonna see in later versions as well. And then after the flood, something happens in that 58 lines that uh, leads us, that, that leaves us wondering uh, how it ended. Uh, where did the ark land? Where did, uh, you know, what happened after that? But the lines that we pick up with on, on tablet three, uh, uh, column five, uh, bottom half of page 33, uh, 
we read that the gods smelt the fragrance, gathered like flies over the offering. When they had eaten the offering, Nintu got up and blamed them all. Then we have this speech from Nintu blaming Elil for the flood and saying that she regrets uh, what they've done. That might seem really weird. We might have no idea how to fit that into the script as we're trying to figure out what that is. Keep that in mind because in the, the two consecutive, uh, the two next versions of the flood story, we're gonna see, read more about that, more explanation and see parallels, but uh, parallels with, uh, with deviations. Then we're told that Elil is still angry. He still doesn't want human beings to survive. He sees the boat uh, on page 34. The warrior Elil spotted the boat and was furious with the Agigi. He says, we, the great uh, Anuna, all of us agreed together in an oath, no form of life should have escaped. How did any man survive the catastrophe? And Inky steps up and says, "You know, I did it in defiance of you. I made sure life was preserved. Uh, he then goes on to say, there's five lines missing, but then he says, exact your punishment from the center and whoever contradicts your order. Uh, and then 12 lines are missing. Uh, this passage is gonna become relevant to us in a much later lecture. Uh, but keep, keep that in mind because I will come back to it. And then we might have a hard time figuring out what's happening in the final page. Inky is giving some sort of advice, although there are broken lines. And he says, uh, let there be one third of the people, among the people, the woman who gives birth yet does not give birth, successfully. Uh, and successfully is in parentheses, potentially because it's been added. Uh, let there be the Pasitu demon among the people to snatch the baby from its mother's lap. Uh, this sounds kind of cruel. We've, you know, Inky has helped avert three different uh, uh, global catastrophes, but now he's saying let there be this sort of infant mortality. After that is the, uh, the rule that certain types of uh, priestesses will not be able to have children. So we have the establishment of a rule that uh, certain people are not, uh, one third of the people will not be able to have children. Uh, these priestesses will not be able to have children. Then we have 26 lines missing in that column and another eight lines in the next column. But this seems to indicate that the problem all along was population. The, uh, the Anunnaki were sending these floods in order to control the human population. But rather than uh, wiping them out, uh, Inky is suggesting, how about we just control the number of people that are able to be born? And that is, again, an etiology of uh, infant mortality and an etiology of uh, why priest certain priestesses are not allowed to have children. It's because uh, the gods need to keep the population down so they don't have to send another catastrophe. We'll come back to all of this uh, when we get to the Flood Tablet and the Epic of Gilgamesh. So we don't have to understand everything just yet. Uh, we'll keep this in mind and then we'll have another text to compare it with uh, later on. So in these fragments that we have from the hand of Epic Aya uh, in the Old Babylonian version, we have the most complete version of Atrahasis. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, clues as to what's going on in other texts. But notice that we had to uh, do a lot of redacting, or at least uh, Stephanie Dolly did that for us in the book, Myths from Mesopotamia. Uh, she included uh, the, the Old Babylonian version of Ipikaya. She uh, included two, at least two standard Babylonian uh, tablets. Uh, these tended to uh, create these doublets. Uh, these, uh, the story would have started and then stop and then start over again uh, and retell part of it and sometimes with conflicts uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, this might seem a frustration. It might seem like uh, a sort of a side note, but for our purposes, this is a very important lesson. It's a lesson we're gonna apply to every text that we're gonna read in the rest of this class. And if you're interested, uh, I mentioned that I included a link to the, um, the Ark Before No, I'm sorry, I included a link to the Nova uh, documentary, Secrets of Noah's Ark, which uh, interviews the cuneiform scholar uh, Irving Finkel, who's the, the head of cuneiform uh, studies at uh, the British Museum in London. Uh, he's the one that translated this tablet. He's the one that found the specifications for uh, the coracle, uh, the round arc. Uh, so uh, I posted a link to that program. Uh, also, if you're curious about the individual flood tablets, I've uh, posted links to those at the museums that hold them. And Irving Finkel has written a book called The Ark Before Noah, in which he talks about the archeology span of flood tablets and helps to reconstruct that world. If uh, uh, This is the kind of thing that might be helpful for a paper or something like that in the future, or personal interest. But your next assignment, uh, for the next text, you're going to have to 
do the sort of thing that Stephanie Dolly has done. Uh, you, next is Epic of Gilgamesh, and then uh, the rest of this week, Unit 2, uh, you're just going to read the first few tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh. But when you do that, you're not going to have to worry about the standard Babylonian version being interspersed with the old Babylonian version. Uh, Stephanie Dolly for Gilgamesh has separated the two. So the most complete text of Gilgamesh is the standard Babylonian version, uh, and at the end of that she includes, all by itself, the Old Babylonian version. And what I'm asking you to do is read one part from the standard Babylonian version, then go to the Old Babylonian version and read the cor corresponding part, then go back to the standard Babylonian version. So you're actually going to have to do the redaction yourself. So in the schedule of readings on Blackboard, uh, I list, first of all, I list several uh, video lectures which I haven't produced yet, uh, but as I produce them, I'll post them there. Those, uh, that text will become a link, and you'll be able to click on it and go to YouTube, or it'll be posted in, uh, in the uh, Unit 2 section uh, below this video. But watch that uh, introduction to Gilgamesh, or go ahead and start reading the tablets. But be sure you read in the order I've prescribed in the Schedule of Reading section. Read Gilgamesh Standard Babylonian Tablets uh, 1 through uh, uh, tablet 2, uh, column 4, and that's on Stephanie Dolly's uh, Myths of Mesopotamia, pages 50 to 61. Then switch over to page 136 and read 136 through 142, and that's the Old Babylonian version, uh, tablet 1, tablet 2, and uh, up to tablet 3, uh, column uh, 2. Uh, then go back to the Standard Babylonian version, read 61 to 77, then go to the Old Babylonian version uh, and, and read 142 to 148. So you're reading the same story, two different text, two different narratives, and you're doing the redaction yourself. Then uh, you're going to read uh, about a tablet and read the, the text of a tablet that has been translated since Stephanie Dolly uh, wrote uh, your book, wrote Myths from Mesopotamia. So you're going to uh, have to do some redaction outside the book. Uh, this is going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be worth it. This is a, an exercise in the kind of thing that storytellers and story scholars, or textual scholars, uh, have had to do for, as we see, 4,000 years. So I've given you the links to an article about this newly discovered tablet and a link to the uh, transcription, a translation of the tablet uh, itself. Now obviously you're going to see uh, transliteration from the cuneiform into uh, our modern letters, but with the pronunciation uh, and with the words that you won't recognize. Obviously you don't have to read uh, the ancient uh, Babylonian, but there is an English translation in that PDF by Al-Rawi and George uh, read that translation. This, these are lines from uh, the, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh that fit into an area where there's a gap in both the, the Standard Babylonian Version and the Old Babylonian Version that you have uh, in Stephanie Dolly's text. But it's all laid out for you in the schedule of readings, uh, so just follow those steps. And if, uh, if you're reading ahead uh, before I make the video, uh, it's going to be okay. Just come back and watch the videos once they're up.